I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, my one. We can hear you. How are you? Fine. Confined, but fine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I think everyone is on that same situation right now. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, uh, I'm I'm surviving. Yes, uh, that's the most important, right? Uh, everything, everyone is healthy. Exactly. And, yes. So yeah, we have love to be to be with yes. you guys there. Yes, yeah. uh, everyone is missing, uh, let's say, the physical conference and uh, also the the discussions, the present discussion. So, okay, I think we. It's uh, 9 a.m. here. It's uh, 1 p.m. in France. I think we can start. Is that okay for you, Mehon? We can start or? Uh, we can start, no problem. I'm very happy. Okay, so let me uh, just make an introduction, some uh, advertisements. So good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Charles Cavalcanti. I'm going to be the host of this, the first panel section of uh, SBRT 2020. So I'm quite honored and quite happy to introduce uh, my colleague, my friend, Professor Mehron Deba. I'm going to make a very short introduction of his extensive curriculum. So Professor Mehwan Deba is an IEEE fellow and a full professor at Central Supalec in the region of Paris, France. And since 2014, he has also been a vice president of Huawei France Research Center and the director of the Mathematical and Algorithm Science Laboratory. More recently, has, uh, he has also been nominated the director of the Lagrange Mathematical and Computer Research Center, also in Paris and his uh, research interests are on the intersection of wireless communications, information theory, statistics, focusing on random matrix theory, and more recently on artificial intelligence. He has been awarded several times by his achievements on best paper awards and other aspects of recognition of his extensive and very successful career in the wireless area. And I would like to pass the floor, to, to give the floor to Professor Deba to start his present plenary speech on 5G and the wireless road ahead. I think we have a good audience for that. And uh, by the way, questions should be typed in the chat. And at the end, I will organize and we try to address every question as soon as we have uh, time for those, okay? So Mehwan, please, uh, you are you have the floor and we are eager to listen to you. Many thanks for accepting the invitation for by the organization. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Charles. Uh, I'm very happy to, to be here with you. I would have loved to be physically with you in Brazil. Uh, I have many colleagues, as you know, in, in Brazil. I had spent also my early career, research career, collaborating with uh, many outstanding professors in Brazil. And I, I really miss you all. And I hope uh, 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 next time will be a good opportunity to, to have a, a, a longer, I uh, would say, conference. And also the, 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 the opportunity for me to give also a longer speech when I'll be there. Uh, my talk uh, is going to be about um, what's beyond 5G and the road ahead. And I hope you will enjoy it. And of course, I'm uh, totally open to answer your questions. As far as I'm concerned, I am uh, uh, actually um, uh, director of two labs of Huawei. I'm director of what we call the Huawei Mathematical and Algorithmic Sciences Lab, which focuses mostly on uh, basically uh, 5G and beyond, but also things like optical communication, computing, and, uh, and, uh, and also basically things which are related to AI. Uh, we opened recently another research institute, which is called the Lagrange Mathematical and Computing Research Center, which focuses more on fundamental research on what I call post von Neumann research, post von Neumann in terms of architectures, uh, also post Shannon theories and others. And I hope if you have the opportunity to visit France that you'll come and, and visit the center also. And I've been also involved in many things in, in, in the research community. Uh, my field of research is basically 5G and beyond and AI for wireless. So uh, 
before I start my talk, I think, uh, uh, and, and give you at least the, the vision of what I think would happen in the next years, I'd like to make a, a small summary of Huawei and explain basically also the, the things which are happening in our industry. Uh, many of you know the company Huawei through our consumer products. The company started uh, 30 years ago, 19, 1987, so it's a quite young company. It started as uh, what we call a communication technology company in the sense that we provided to the majority of operators in the world their global infrastructure in terms of 2G, 3G, 4G, and now 5G. And as you can see progressively, the company has been uh, going towards the market of what we call consumer, uh, uh, where we're selling basically devices. Uh, these devices are laptops, uh, phones, uh, 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 ear glasses, and other things like that. Then to the enterprise, and then as you can see, a big, a big growth toward these last year, the topic of AI. And so the company is not considered anymore as a communication technology company, but what we call an ICT company, an information and communication technology. And this example that I'm giving you here for Huawei is happening to all major, uh, basically, companies which were dealing with communication. It's also happening to also a lot of universities which are seeing a lot of convergence towards what I call the EE department, electrical engineering department, and computer science department. Many of my colleagues that I know around the world who are in academia have been shifting also their interest towards the topic of machine learning and AI, where they are all, we're all basically supporters of signal processing and communication, uh, uh, or at least signal processing and information theory for communication. So what we're seeing today, I think, is a big change in our discipline to which we have to take care is this convergence, the convergence of three things, of communication, storage, and computing. And this makes also a lot of uh, teaching that we used to do more and more interdisciplinary because the boundaries between the fields are getting a bit blurred. And so my talk also is going to be about this vision where we're starting to have this convergence and the impact of this convergence, which is gonna have a huge basically benefit for the next wireless, I would say, uh, vision that I'm gonna be showing. So I'm not, uh, since I don't have the audience here, um, I don't know exactly your background and if you know a bit of communication, but if basically we go to what I call the G waves, G here means generation, we've been growing, going through several generations. 2G, as many of you know, started basically in terms of conceptual, uh, uh, I would say, definition around 1987. And we started building what we call the 2G network from 1990 to 2010. In general, a generation is defined by KPIs. Well, what is a KPI? It means it's a requirement. The definition of KPI means key performance indicator to be more precisely. But basically, it provides you basically a certain target or requirement that you need to fulfill. The generation is completely different from the technology. Typically for 2G, we have several technologies which fulfill the KPI of 2G, which was mo mobile for voice. And as you know, GSM is one of the most successful technology that fulfills the 2G requirement. But we have also, of course, others like IS95 in the US and other places in the world. And I think it's very important for you to differentiate between what we call a KPI or a requirement or a generation from the technology that fulfills from that. Now, I went very fast here for 1990 and 2G in the sense of giving you the requirements. In general, if you look at the tables of standardization behind, the requirements are more precise in what is the quality that you need to fulfill for that. Around 1995, same thing, we started thinking, and one of the requirements which came was mobile for data. And uh, 3G happened around 2000, and it's still going on today until the, till 2020. And it's roughly around 20 years, and we're starting to see some shutdown of some 3G networks. Same thing, various technologies have been fulfilling the requirement of 3G. You have what we call the TDD time division duplex CDMA, especially in China. And you have another version, which is the FDD, basically version around the world in many countries, especially in Europe and in, 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 in America. Then the same thing around 2008, we started thinking about what would be the next generation requirement. We started thinking about mobile for internet after fixed internet, mobile for internet. And 4G has been starting to be deployed since 2010 and it's continuing until 2030. By continuing, when I explain this of 20 years, in general, you have some uh, 
uh, acronyms around 4G, which are called 4G+, 4G++. These are all the evolutions that we're making to make mobile for internet better. Same thing, differentiate between the requirements of a generation and technology. 4G is not only LTE, which is the most successful, I would say, technology that fulfills the requirements of 4G. You have also WiMAX, for example, which is also a technology that for, for, fulfills, sorry, the requirements for mobile for internet. You have to know, by the way, that we were so focused in developing mobile for internet within 4G that voice does not work as good as it should be in 4G. You have to know that voice in 4G, since it's mobile for internet, is voice over IP. It's called voice over LTE. And when we were starting to deploy basically uh, our smartphones on 4G, many customers started to complain. And you have to know that today we have a system called CS fallback, circuit switch fallback, which means that whenever you make a call on a 4G network, you switch to 2G, 3G. And whenever you surf or browse on internet, you go 4G. Now today we can spend time. We have been these last couple of years trying to work on how to make voice over IP as good as 2G. And we're starting to get some good results and some in countries in the world are starting to deploy it because of the farming of frequencies that we want to do with 2G. But this also expresses that whenever you look at um, voice as an application and not a technology, in general, you don't get the right basically results and it's always better to build something from scratch like a technology and not like an application. Same thing around 2012, we start thinking about how the world will go. Uh, we started thinking and uh, 5G is tailor to something called mobile for things. And uh, since the, this year, we're starting to have massive deployments around the world. And this will continue until 2040. Today in 2020, of course, are the next steps. And as I told you, what we're seeing is the fact that there's this, this convergence of communication, storage, and computing. And this convergence of communication, communi uh, communication and uh, uh, storage and computing is what we call, call here machines, meaning things with the ability to have AI embedded. And the question we're asking today is if basically the protocols that we're having today, which are massively deployed, especially internet and others, which are mostly linking dumb objects, are they good for having basically objects which are basically more proactive, which have computing capability, which are called machines? So of course, the deployments that we're seeing and we're forecasting is in the regime of 2030, 2050. And what I'm gonna present you here is basically what would need to be done to make mobile for machines happen and making the shift from something which is connecting things to something which is more about connecting intelligence in a network. And of course, the protocol that are gonna be built in the next 10 years in terms of physical layer, but also at the network layer, at the protocol layer, at the security, IP, whatever you can call it, layer, is extremely important to make this shift of uh, basically uh, approach happen. And uh, the purpose of my talk today is to provide you what are the challenging topics that need to be addressed to make it happen. And so to make that vision happen, I think there are three aspects that need to be solved. The first thing is basically the capability of sensing, which has increased, and for which basically these machines will require extremely sophisticated sensing techniques. Localization is part of that. You need to localize yourself in a 3D environment, but other also things which will happen with the fact that radio frequencies will not be used anymore to send data, but or transmit bits, but to do much more things than just transmit. It's something that we knew in the years before. Radars are typically that. A radar, as you know, does not transmit bits. We don't use the waves or the electromagnetic features to transmit information, but basically to be able to detect. And I think we're seeing a full trend of research today where the will of using radio frequency to do something else than transmit bit is happening. Second thing, which I think is extremely important also is the fact that we will require more and more data rates in our environment. The massive connectivity that is happening will increase. And also the more and more sophisticated, I would say, uh, cameras that are being there will require new kinds of rates and we'll talk about it. And the last one is, of course, the magical 
shift that is happening towards what I call computing and the capability of the device to compute more and more, which enables, of course, to solve new kinds of problems within our realm. So let's start with the first one, which I call sensing. So as you all know today, uh, the phones which are sold today are not sold because they have 5G or 4G, it's a standard, but because of all the external features that you have on a phone. The first, of course, major feature that a phone or why you buy a phone is mostly because of its aesthetic, how beautiful it is. The second reason why you buy a phone today is mostly because of the battery, how long it lasts. And that makes a difference between the different, I would say, uh, 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 um, uh, manufacturers of phone. The third one is, of course, the perception in terms of image that that phone brings you. And today you have to know that the majority of cameras which are sold on, on, on the market have much more capability than basically the human eye. Same thing in terms of sensing capability, the measurements that today a phone can make is extremely outstanding. By the way, I didn't mention the fourth reason why you buy a phone today. Well, the reason why you buy a phone today is mostly because you have what we call computing capability on the phone, a massive computing capability, which is much bigger than what you have on a classical laptop and which enables, of course, a lot of uh, new apps related to AI that can be deployed on your phone and on which basically you can do some very sophisticated things. Now, when I, we look at the capability of uh, basically the perception, well, the idea is how you can use radio frequencies to do something else than just the bits. The first thing that uh, we're envisioning in the future is of course the capability of using waves to be able to see behind hiding objects. And this is, of course, due to the reflections that you get when you transmit the signal and then you can detect. Same thing, of course, in terms of detecting the kind of quality that you have your, in your food. And all these aspects are, in fact, related to the fact that we are using today more and more of our frequencies not to transmit bit. You can do also, of course, the same thing at the infrastructure level, where today the base stations that we're deploying are envisioned also to be able to reconstruct the environment to do 3D reconstructions of the texture of the environment, doing 3D map reconstruction. And this is, of course, a big uh, tendency of research that we're seeing in many, many of the papers uh, that are being published. And this is, of course, can be done not only because of the RF, but also the, all the analytics, which can do the classification, which enables, of course, to detect all the things that we're doing here. So, of course, the sensing that I'm talking about can be done at the classical physical layer using the classical impulse radio as a signature and be able to infer from that. But it also can be done at the network level. And we're seeing also a lot of work that being done at uh, what I call here a sensing assisted network. Now, the question you can ask me is that many of the things that we're talking about are not new. While they're new in the sense that our sensing accuracy has increased drastically because these last years, the radio frequency community has been using more and more higher frequencies in basically the work they're doing. And so you have to know this is a bit of physics, but if you go higher in frequency, it means basically that your resolution increases. Why? Because you have something called a wavelet. And the wavelet basically is the resolution with which you see the environment. And so basically, if you go in a very high frequency, then your wavelet is very small. And then you can distinguish objects within basically a very short distance. And this is classical. If uh, you want to see the environment, what you do, you project basically a wave, and then you see the reflection that you have. Now, if in a given environment, you do it at a higher frequency, then you see tables in the room. But then as you go in higher and higher frequencies, you can see even the molecules of the room. And I think this is a big shift that we're seeing. And it's also being more and more, I would say, uh, uh, a tendency in the sense that millimeter wave has been one of the big topics within 5G. And one of the things that we're seeing also is the move toward what I call portable terahertz, where the frequencies above 60 gigahertz, 100 gigahertz and more are starting also to be used, not anymore for just screen communication, but be able to do all the things I was talking about through localization and other aspects. Okay, second point, uh, which I think is important is basically the computing aspects. And uh, this computing aspects, I'll spend a bit of time on it and try to, depending on the people who listen to me, I don't know your background, try to explain why it has become so important and what we think are the different directions. 
So these three guys who have um, been awarded what we call the 2019 Turing Awards are like superstars in the world. So they are quite famous because of um, one sub, I would say, theme of AI machine learning, which is called deep neural networks. In my talk, I will be exchanging AI machine learning and deep learning, but they are quite different. And uh, we could spend a couple of hours where I could do a course explaining the big differences, but you have to know that deep neural networks is a subpart of basically uh, machine learning uh, techniques, which is a subpart of what we call AI. And so of course, these uh, three guys have established around the 90s, uh, some kind of breakthrough framework, which is at the heart of all the big progress that we're really having. I'll explain, of course, the limitation of that and why we're still using that. But of course, uh, since we're in a research uh, audience, we should not be limited to the way they did it. So let's start to understand why it has become important. So here uh, on this slide, I have two pictures. One on the right is the picture of a guy called Newton. And I think you're all familiar with Newton. And what Newton did was basically provide us the Newton equations, which is exactly the requirement that you need to do what we call cinematics. And in particular, to be able to compute the angle of a kicking or what we call ballistic kick. So if you wanna kick at a given distance, let's say 100 meters, this is a classical exercise that is given to to high school students where we ask them, well, you want to kick a ball at 100 meters, give me the angle with which you can kick the ball. And so what the students will do is solve that equation and be able to find the angle theta with which you, you can kick the ball. And this is quite classical. Now, the question is that in many of the scenarios that we have in uh, networks, unfortunately, we don't have a model. And especially we don't have what we call an end-to-end -end model. What I mean by that is that in general, we understand a very fraction partial vision of the network. We understand the wireless, but we don't understand how the video from the consumer goes exactly to that point because there's a lot of different compression schemes. There are joint source coding. There is an IPSEC protocol, which is embedded. And so we're not able to have a formulation which is end-to-end. -end. And so here in this case is the same. You need to kick the ball and you don't have Newton. So what do you do? Well, it's quite classical and we know it. You will kick the ball like hell. You will kick the ball many times and you're gonna write in a table with two columns. On the first column, you're gonna write the distance and on the second column, you're gonna write the angle. This is called big data. You will generate a lot of data. And if you're smart enough, you're gonna do a sampling of your space, which is gonna be quite good. You're not gonna be kicking the ball at the same distances or very close every time but you're gonna do as much as kicks as you want, which are very diverse in the generation or in the sampling of your data. And so next time your boss asks you to kick a ball, well, basically what you're gonna do, you're gonna look if that distance that he gave you is in the database. So this is not new, it's called data mining. It's been, the year, it's been there for years and has nothing to do with intelligence. It's just a search. But still, if you need to do that search, you need to do it in an intelligent manner in the sense that you're not gonna search for the distance 450 meters, one meter, two meter, three meter, and you're going like that, you're gonna clusterize your data and your algorithm is gonna understand very fast that 450 meter is in the class 400, 500. So you're gonna go directly that class. And then by subclasses, you're gonna find exactly the distance. Now, where we're gonna talk about AI, but in fact, it has nothing to do with AI, is if the distance is not in the data that you have. So imagine that 450 meter is not there. What you're gonna do is you're gonna do regression. So you're gonna do some kind of linear combination of the distances to find 400 meter with the existing distances. And then you're gonna do the right regression that you need to do in the angle domain to find with which angle you can do it. So mathematically, this is basically an approximation of function because you're trying to find basically how y, which is equal, which is the distance, is equal to f of theta, which f is the mapping that you want. And so this learning of function is nothing else than a regression. Of course, there are some sophisticated mathematical tools to do that. It's based on the continuity or not of the two spaces that you need to do, and you can move forward like that. Today, of course, we don't do it this way because people have built up a whole framework that shows case that this 
function approximation that I'm telling you about can be approximated by an architecture, which is called a neural network. So you don't need to do it by hand mathematically and finding if that function can be approximated by a polynomial or not. It can be approximated by this architecture, which we call a neural network. So this is magic. And second, we have a lot of software people who have built the tools to do it. These tools are called TensorFlow. They're called Apache. And so today you don't need to do anything. You just need to have a black box where you will train that black box by having an input, which is the distance and the output is going to be the angle. And once you have trained that box, next time you're asked to take kick at 450 meter, you can find exactly the angle which you kick. So it's a bit of magic and you don't need a lot of work to do. So the example I gave, he, gave you here is an example I'm giving on purpose. Why? Because this is exactly what we do today when we do massive MIMO beamforming. So as you know, when you want to do beamformer in wireless, you will generate or try to calculate basically what is the zero forcing MMSC match filter that you're going to build. And this is going to be related, of course, also to the kind of frequencies you're going to use, the channel models you're going to use, and all these things. Today, you don't need to do that. What you do is that for a given position of the UE equipment, you will send a beam and learn that this is the right beam. Second position, you do this. Third position, you do this. Once you have sampled the space enough, you can automatically find the new beam for a new position by doing some kind of interpolation of the previous beams. And so you don't even need to do those interpolation. You just need to use that software that I'm talking about and be able to find exactly the beam for a given UE position. This is called AI-based massive MIMO beamforming. And so it's quite magic because a lot of problems on which we were trying to model, which was extremely complicated, we have here a very neat technique to do it. And it can go even forward in the sense that today we can replace Maxwell equations with this approach. Today, if you have measurements of the electromagnetic field in various points, you can find what is the electromagnetic field in your new point based on this approach that you could call AI, but which is just a regression of your space and basically be able to infer on a new position. So it's quite magic because we can replace a lot of mathematical equations that we had by this approach. Now it sounds magic because if I tell you you don't need any more Newton, you don't need any more Navier-Stokes, you don't need any more uh, Maxwell, it, it seems quite surprising. Well, it's surprising up to some, I would say limitation that you need to understand. And I wanna go on this limitation. And once you have understood that, you understand basically this big progress that we're having. The first limitation that we're having here is basically the fact that um, suppose that you have trained your black box of kicking the ball when it was sunny and your boss asks you to kick the ball when it's windy. Then unfortunately you need to retrain for every new configuration that you have. So one of the caveats is that AI requires a lot of retraining and a lot of data for every configuration and it costs. It costs complexity and it costs energy. But of course, you know, if you don't have any choice, that's the only way to do. Of course, we have today some sophisticated techniques to do what we call transfer learning, maybe meaning that when I learned when it was sunny, then I can transfer that knowledge to when it's windy. It's classical because basically when you have databases which are correlated, you can do this transfer. A very specific example, you know how to speak English. Learning German is faster because the German and English Languages have some correlation and there's a lot of uh, similarities. But however, you learn English and you want to learn Arabic, there is no basically similarities. And so transfer learning does not work. A more concrete example in the communication realm, you have optimized a beamformer in a base station, which was in a given town. And then basically you want, instead of retraining from scratch another base station in that same town, well, instead of doing it from scratch, you can initialize your neural network at some parameters, which are close to the previous one. And you only need additional data, which is not too big to optimize it based on the new layout and buildings that you have in that region. Second caveat, which is important is basically the fact that the input output parameters are not always so easy to determine. Here I went fast in this example. I told you that there was a one-to-one -one mapping between distance and angle. In fact, it's wrong. You need also to know what we call the initial speed, the V0 that I'm putting here. And so this is a classical problem that we have when we start using AI. 
is to be able to know what are the inputs and output parameters which are relevant. A more concrete example, suppose that you are an AI expert working in the health industry and the doctor comes to you and tells you, look, you have two columns. One is the temperature of the patients. Second column is the fact that they have cancer or not. Now I give you a new temperature of a patient. Tell me who has a cancer. It seems obvious that with these two columns, it's not able to infer on the cancer. So as a data scientist or an expert, you're going to ask a new column. You're going to ask the blood pressure. You try that, it doesn't work. Then you're going to ask another new column, which is basically maybe the historical, I would say, uh, or the history of the patients in terms of who is mother, father, things like that. So this is a hard job in general because you are in a trial and error situation and you need basically some intuition to know what are the input output parameters. Last problem that we have with this technique is of course that once you have learned on how to kick on earth, you have no clue on how to kick on the moon. So whenever there's a completely new situation, what you have learned in the past is not basically uh, helping you for the future. Of course, this is not related to the fact that it's AI or not. It's related specifically to the kind of algorithm that we're using, which is basically based on regressions and correlations and for which this deep neural network structure at least explodes. We can still be able basically to learn on the data on how to kick the moon by exploiting some kind of invariant property. For example, in this case, we know that gravity is an invariant, meaning if you do a rotation of your data, if you do a translation of your data, it will not change the gravity. And so what it means, it means that to advance and make some advance, advancements in this field, you would need some new tools which are, required, which are related to topology or geometry, which exploit the topological structure of the data. This is, by the way, ongoing research on which people are trying to reveal some new kind of algorithms to be able to extract what I call here the environment. I think here you get the clue on the basics on why it has become important and will go much faster now. Up to two slides that I need to mention because I thought that this is also very important for our community. The first one, of course, is that uh, the idea of replacing models with this, I would say, data-driven approach dates back to the speech recognition community. So I know that in Brazil, many people did their PhD in what I call speech recognition. And in speech recognition, you have to know many people spend time trying to do models and to model here what I call the larynx. And modeling that larynx here was basically on the idea of a filtering process and working on that. All the PhDs working on the 80s never succeeded. The day we understood that speech recognition was what we call a classification problem in the sense that you measure a lot, a lot, a lot of sentences. And next time somebody says something, you will try to compare it or correlate it with the others. Then that was when there was a breakthrough done in speech recognition. And of course, the fact that this community was very successful had a huge impact on trying to push this approach to the other communities. Third thing also, which is quite important, is basically the data. I've been mentioning rapidly the fact that you sample the space, but here what I want to suggest is more a problem that uh, comes from the fact that uh, uh, you as academic have many issues related to data. In general, you don't have the data and it's basically companies who have the data. And then you try to argue with many companies in trying to provide you the data by saying, okay, to be able to improve our system, we need your data. And then the response they give you in general is the fact that, it, well, there's privacy issues, so we can't reveal the data. It's not the main reason. Privacy is certainly an issue. I take my company, Huawei here, for example. Uh, we don't have the data of the users. It's the operator who has. We have data of networks on how they behave. So we could, up to some extent, depending on the situation, provide our data to basically the community and especially the academic community. But there's a more important problem which I call here revealing your know-how or you're revealing your intellectual property. And why I'm saying this is because when we provide the data, we cannot provide you the data like that. We also need to provide you how we have been able to create or generate the data. What are the procedures that we have put into place to get the data? And the problem is that if we, if we reveal the procedures on how we created the data, then basically we reveal our expertise, our know-how. And this is what I call intellectual property, it belongs to us. So if we reveal basically how we work, 
then basically you get what we call a competitive advantage. And this example is gonna be very, I would say, illustrative of the words that I'm saying right now. So this is an airplane, and this is typically the kind of fighting airplane which was bombarding Europe in the 40s and coming back in the bases in England. And the red dots that you're seeing here are basically the bullets that those airplanes were getting. So the more red dots you have, the more bullets were shot down, were shot on that plane. And so the commander of the of the of 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 the of the of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the the place asked at that time the statisticians because this is how they were called at that time. Well, tell me, guys, uh, where should we reinforce the plane so that we don't lose any more planes? And so the statisticians there they work very nice, nightly. They started saying, well, where there's more dots, you should put more basically metal in order to protect. And then, of course, the pilot came in and said, no, you're wrong. You should put more metal where there is not a single red dot. And the reason why they said that is quite evident. They said that because basically uh, the planes were, which were shot down were shot down exactly on the cockpit, on the regions where you see no red dot. And so these planes never came back. And so what I mean by that is that the data scientists were analyzing missing data. They didn't know that the data that they had, there were a lot of missing elements. And these missing elements was because the planes that did not come back were shut down. So what it means, it means that if you play with data and we don't tell you exactly how it was extracted, what is missing, you may incur into false conclusions by doing this approach. And this is a tedious work that you need to be aware of when you start working in this discipline. Now, of course, AI is not new. It started in the 1956 where uh, the major people that we know were there, Wiener was there, Turing was there, Shannon was there, and then it started with a big hype around the topic, of course, of AI. Then it got a winter, and then around the end of 70s and 80s, also in Brazil, many people did some PhDs around what we call expert systems. It got a certain, I would say, uh, 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 momentum, and then there was a winter, and now it's getting a huge momentum. Why it's getting a huge momentum? Because of three things. First, of course, is the massive amount of data which is being available. Second is the fact that today we have more and more better machine learning algorithms, although the majority of machine learning algorithms that we are using today, they date back from the 90s. And third one, which I think is the most important, is what I call the computing capacity. Meaning today, it's much more easier to compute than to solve. It's much more easier to interpolate with basically different electromagnetic field that you measured to find a new one than to solve the Maxwell equations with all the boundary conditions. And this is due to the computing power. Now, of course, my, I think personally that there will be another winter and that winter will be mostly related to what I call the energy consideration where till today to get the same number as we used to get before, the amount of energy which is poured in the system in terms of computing capability is too much. And we need to go back to approaches which are related to compression. But this is my point of view. And this will, of course, incur a new winter if we don't do significant progress in the way we are basically using the data in our realm. Now, of course, the algorithms which are used today are the majority of people that were telling you have shifted from electrical engineering, classical to these topics. And we're seeing many, many people coming from different fields to play around that. Now, why I insisted on that? Because I think today we have, of course, a new paradigm related to computing for wireless. One of the good features about my company and especially Huawei is that we provide what we call an end-to-end -end solution, meaning that we work at the same time at the network level, at the base station level, at the core level, on the pipes and on the device. We realized quite rapidly that the classical approach of using AI was too narrow and too cloud in the sense that you had to bring all the data back to the network, compute it to generate the model and then transmit it to the, the, the various devices. It turns out that today with 5G, we're seeing a lot of consideration where we can't do cloud computing anymore. And this is why we have decided to go towards more approaches which are called on-device AI, where AI is directly computed on learning agents. So one of the reasons, of course, if you look at 5G, 
uh, in fact, you have three, is first the latency. In general, you don't have time that all the data goes back to the network and then uh, you take a decision before it goes back. Second, of course, is the fact that um, we have problems of privacy. Many people do not want to have their data out of the phone. And third one is coverage, meaning that when you are in, a, let's say, a, 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 a plain mode on your phone, your phone does not become dumb for some reason. It starts continuing working. And as you can see today, we have the capability of doing inference and training up to something like the earphone. And this is quite important in terms of challenges. So of course, when you look at that, it changes the whole paradigm of how cellular it is. And this is what I call native AI networks. The question then resolved to, to the problem of what are the right signaling mechanisms we have to do, such as we can basically learn with different devices without doing all this extraction. And today there's a lot of work which is being done on trying to find what is what I call here the unified training and inference network, where basically some things are done at the device level, some things are done at the edge level, and some things are done at the cloud level. It's in within the framework called distributed AI. It's in the framework of things which are called distributed optimization. And basically it opens doors in the sense that uh, there's a lot of new, I would say, protocols and frameworks on which you can build in. I give you an example today, one of the most famous algorithm which is being pushed is called federated learning, in which each, each device or each device based on the data that it has will learn locally basically uh, and optimize its neural network. The optimization is not gonna be done quite nicely because there's not enough data, but the neighboring device will do the same. The other device will do the same. And then what you'll be doing is that you're going to extract the model from your device. And the model here is just the weights of your neural network and the number of layers. And you're going to send this to the base station. And then the base station is going to aggregate, create the meta model based on those models, and then broadcast the models. And then these, these devices will work on these different things. This is called multi-agent basically learning. You have various features if you do it multi-agent federated learning, but you have also other techniques like multi-agent, uh, basically uh, um, uh, reinforcement learning and other techniques. It has the good part also because it tells you that also in the future, some of the protocols that we're creating related to the transmission that we do could be also based on these AI techniques. You have many people working with respect to the creation of waveform directly based on these techniques, since you can compute what is the right waveform for a given context that you have. And I think uh, this will open doors for a lot of interesting things that also will have an impact in the standardization, since the whole framework of signaling is totally open on how often you will exchange this in different information different between the different places. And as you can see, the shift that I was talking about, which was basically very centralized as a network, with basically a cloud, a core network and a seller is going towards more and more native AI, I would say approaches in which you have a mix and uh, on which the mix needs also to be fulfilled between terminal AI, site AI, edge AI and cloud AI. Let me now go back to the last point, which I think is important is of course the connectivity mechanism. So the first one of the connectivity mechanism is of course, why do we need to go farther? So there's been already a lot of studies which are being done showcasing that the need for more bits is there. And especially from the autonomous flying transportation industry where we're talking about four terabit per day. So it's not related to the fact that you want to control the car but it's mostly related to the high number of cameras which are now embedded in the cars. For a lot of services for which the car industry is thinking about, real-time Google Street, other things which they want to sell to the various places and for which basically streaming all that data continuously and on which basically you can then exploit some services behind is roughly around four terabit per day. Per car, we're talking today around of, of, of a number of around eight cameras on a car just to give you a hint of what's happening. Now, of course, when you look at how to do it, we're quite limited because uh, the approach we had before was basically an approach related to Shannon and as you know, Shannon devised in 1948 already, I would say the means to transmit by having this model. And it took us many years of engineering to approach those limits through what I call polar codes, turbo codes, LDPC codes. 
And so the question is that, is there still a margin to get? Well, I think there's two margins to get here. The first margin is that one of the caveats of the model, it's not related to information theory, it's related to the model that Shannon had, was the fact that memory was not there. Meaning you didn't have memory at the transmitter and memory at the receiver. And memory plays a crucial role. Why? Because if you have memory, you can store. And if you can store, it means that you can store the past. And if you can store the past, it means that you can build between the transmitter and the receiver some kind of context. What it means, it means that by building a context between a transmitter and receiver, you can reduce the amount of information that you need to transmit to get the same goal. This is called semantic communication. It's getting a big hype today in the research field. And it's related, of course, to the fact that uh, Shannon had devised it in one of his problems called level B uh, problem, and on which we take into account the semantic, which is built based on the context that has been built. Second also issue that uh, we had with the Shannon model is that in order to optimize the transmission, uh, you could only optimize the TX, what I call the transmitter and the RX. However, the environment was taking as an independent entity. Today, we have been seeing some major progress to be able to have a programmable environment on which you could have an impact. And I think you're quite familiar with that. Whenever you do a deployment, well, you have the base station, you have the receiver, but you would be extremely happy if you could move the building in front of you to have line of sight, or if you could move some objects around to get a better communication scheme. Now, moving physically buildings is extremely hard, and we can't do it, at least today. But maybe futuristic, mobile, basically, cities may change that. However, there has been some very important progress, which has been done on what I call metamaterials and metasurfaces, in which basically the texture of the building by adding basically the surfaces can make it such as the environment overall from an experimentic perspective becomes more and more constructive towards your destination rather than destructive. And so recently there's been a big progress on the design of these metamaterials with different, I would say, um, very good, uh, I would say showcasing results where indoor or outdoor, you can have some drastic improvements by these metamaterials. The kind of research which is being done today is called large intelligent surfaces, reflecting intelligent surfaces, holographic MIMO, and you go on like that. And I think this is a big trend on which basically we had very few clue on how basically we could build it. Today, of course, there are still a big issues related to mobility, CSI acquisition, but there are many, many cases where we're seeing a lot of progress in which we can program digitally the environment and in some sense, move it. And then when I mean programming and digitally, it's not just about something called a, 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 a relay, but it's really about changing the way the wave behaves such as you have constructive interference rather than destructive interference towards your, your intended receiver. And so if you have time, I strongly encourage you to read this paper that we did a couple one year ago and which was uh, published and, and which gives also a very good idea on how you can build these things. Of course, this is happening today because of the way progress that we've been doing in the antenna design. And as you can see today, uh, people from uh, the IEEE communication, especially antennas and propagation, are having a huge impact on the communication community, and especially on what I call here electromagnetic information theory, meaning embedding basically the physics of antennas, which enable you basically to be able to change a lot of features, either as intelligent relays or active relays or smart relays, but also at the TX level by basically embedding also a lot of holographic transmissions that we're, we're not used to it. Now, of course, for this vision to happen, there are still some steps. Uh, we still don't know if 6G is gonna be there, but if it, the story continues as a global standard, uh, I think there's a good opportunity for all our research community and especially for people uh, working in Brazil to build up, I would say, the technological breakthroughs that are required by 2024. So you still have a time. And I think it's a good timing in the sense that uh, if you start a PhD next year, you have three years to finalize it with some breakthrough technologies, which could be the building block for that before it starts being done within study groups and specification groups afterwards.
And, uh, and as a company, of course, we're looking forward for many breakthroughs that can be made when in this realm of uh, uh, these three things that I was talking about, sensing, computing, and basically classical uh, connectivity that I'm talking about. Today, you have to know that there are a couple of papers here and there, especially from um, uh, colleagues from Uru, who have been starting to define what could be basically uh, a 6G vision, but in terms of KPI, in the same, I would say, philosophy that the KPIs were designed in uh, 2G and 4G. And if you have time, you can go on their website and look at the numbers that they've been giving, which provides you a couple of uh, key, I would say, performance indicators to move forward the boundaries that we had before. And they are quite, I would say, impressive with, of course, as I told you, uh, the three combinations and the three, I would say, uh, visions that I was mentioning that could contribute to these three uh, features. Okay, I think I'll stop here and uh, willing to answer your questions and I hope it was interesting. Thank you, Mehran. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, very exciting to hear about your thoughts and ideas. So we have uh, started to have questions. I have some as well. Uh, I don't know if you can see the chat, but uh, I can read, of course. Uh, for example, one colleague, Bruno Fontana Silva, uh, he is asking about uh, if Huawei is still working on NOMA, specifically on SCMA for 5G or 6G. Uh, and then also, okay, go on, please, if you... Okay, so... So, some questions are. Yeah. So, for, for 5G, it's not anymore since the 5G standardization has finished. So, SCMA is not going to be pushed. However, of course, for the various, I would say, uh, 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 solutions for massive connectivity that we're talking about for the 6G KPIs that I mentioned uh, uh, just before here, I don't know if you see my slide, around 10 million per, per kilometer square. Uh, of course, these are still studied in terms of how you can do NOMA with very low complexity. And SCMA may be a solution. But of course, today we're open to all the different approaches to be able to do it. However, for 5G per se, SCMA was not included in the standardization process. We were able to push, as you all know, polar codes in the standard, but that, not SCMA. Okay, we have also another question from Antonio Carlos. Uh, he asks about how to deal with the trade off between AI processing and energy efficiency. I think you mentioned something about the new winter regarding that. Maybe you can elaborate a little more. Very good question. Very good question. And I think this is the biggest, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, venue of research to be done in the next years. So, uh, 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 of course, uh, all the AI that we've been using so far uh, haven't considered the energy constraint or energy problem uh, to deal with. And, uh, and, uh, and the reason is that basically today we can sustain it. But there was a very nice, I would say, article from MIT uh, this summer showcasing already that if there is not any more, first showcasing that the biggest progress which have been done in AI in these last years were not at all related to algorithms. They were related to chipsets, meaning it, our computing capability to compute faster and more. And this goes back to what I was telling you about computing versus solving, meaning uh, uh, today it's much easier to compute than to solve. And, 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 uh, and basically, uh, uh, this, I think, is a very important research in the sense that uh, we don't have any solution uh, uh, to be able to, to solve uh, that case. I give you just one, one thing, which I think is quite remarkable. Today, AI is heavily used for basically doing uh, energy uh, reduction or energy consumption reduction of networks. In the sense that if you work in networks today, you have what we call sleep modes, which are used for base stations, meaning you want to understand how to turn off and on a base station. So, of course, there was a trend many years ago to do models to do that. And the problem, the models are extremely not accurate in the sense that you take the uh, bits per second per hertz per joule, which is basically the rates divided by the power consumed. And you add the power of the base station, things like that. We realize that there's other effects which are not easy to understand. So we started to use AI in a very efficient manner 
to be able to optimize basically the layout at a given instant with uh, recur recursive neural networks on how to optimize the energy consumption. However, all these results do not take into account the energy used to do these algorithms, clear? So basically what you need to do is of course you reduce the consumption by a factor of 20%, but you also need to, use, to take into account how much energy was spent to get that result. And I think the more and more the configuration changes fast, the more and more you need to recalculate every time and the more and more the energy is there. So I think in terms of venue research, if we don't solve basically how we can reduce drastically the energy consumption of AI, it will be another winter. Okay. Uh, we have another question from our colleague, Professor Luis Meloni from Unicamp. He's asking about if uh, the tensor units that you are mentioning on slide 18 is the same of neural CPUs. So I'm not sure it's, it's 18 and what he's talking about is maybe 20. Do you see my slide? No, uh, I think uh, you need to share uh, again your screen. Okay, sorry. So is it this slide? Yes, uh, he mentions yes. Okay, so it's this slide, yeah. So what, today how things are done, oh. exactly. Actually, no, actually, it's not this slide? It's, it's not 18, I think it's two, two previous one. Uh, I think he, he mentions when you say that uh, the capability okay. of, of processing on, on yeah, that, yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah. So today, how things are done. So you have to know that you mentioned we don't tensor have units a, over there. Okay. So today, how things are done in general, uh, uh, the chipset that we're building for doing AI are very specific. We don't have a general way of doing it. So if I give you an example on our chipsets, we have a uh, a GPU, a CPU, mostly for the uh, modem part. And then we have a couple of what we call neural processing units. Each processing, neural processing unit does a specific task. One is for speech recognition, the other is for uh, voice recognition, and you go on like that. And so the, these NPUs are specifically tailored to that. Now, of course, one of the specific NPU entities are based on these tensor units on which we are building the I think this has to change in the future in the sense that we need to have what we call spatial computing, I would say, architectures. And this is what I called at the beginning, what I call post von Neumann architecture. We cannot anymore be very specific in the way we do, but this is the only way for us to gain. And to give you a more example, more precise, on the way we could push things towards the device, there's more and work working today on what I call binary neural networks. What it means binary neural network is that when you start doing the NPU on a chipset, the consumption is still quite high. So you need to reduce basically the resolution of basically your weights to only be, to only be capable of doing zero and ones and not floating points. And so the problem is that if you go down on the resolution, for example, in your NPU of uh, your weights, then you get into the problem that when you do learning, one of the first step in learning is uh, an algorithm called stochastic gradient descent. Because learning, by the way, is optimization. Huh? When you learn, you optimize. And this is why, by the way, all the electrical engineering community who are experts in optimization has been, have been jumping into machine learning because they know how to optimize. And so the question then in that case goes down in how you can implement basically an optimization feature, which is a gradient descent, in binary, and this is called binary neural networks. We've been working uh, uh, since two years on that. We've been having very interesting results. And this is the kind of things that are being built today on our uh, basically neural processing units. Okay, uh, we have another question from Professor Adebaru. So uh, he's asking about your opinion about end-to-end -end physical layer using deep learning. If you believe that we will see in the future the neural networks substituting all the parts of the communication, all general encoders and so on. Okay. okay. So this is a very good question. And um, 
I, I think there is going to be also maybe some talks around that in, during this conference. So, uh, two things. Um, and I think everybody should be very, very uh, uh, aware of that. Uh, as communication engineers, as communication engineers and especially those who have been doing physical layer, we are very good in, in modeling. So, and, and the success basically of our systems have been, have been yeah. due to the fact that the models we've been using for our communication have been very good and been very robust, okay? And so we've been using models. And today there's been a tendency of revisiting those algorithms. The gains we're seeing today are mostly in, I would say, very awkward places where the I would say hardware, especially related to basically the nonlinear T that you have at the TX or X, are not well modeled. And in this case, of course, it's not modeled to get a system which is called nonlinear. Because you have an end to end system which is nonlinear because of the LNA, uh, uh, let's say, uh, digitalization that you're doing it, IQ imbalances that you're doing, and also the nonlinearities. And so in the case of nonlinear channels, there has been, of course, and there are some gains that you can do using these, I would say, um, uh, auto encoder for transmission. But they're due in general because of uh, hardware, uh, let's say, uh, descriptive. My own feeling now is that the guys who are doing communication are good to do modeling of nonlinear systems. You can look at some papers that have been done recently. I think we can solve those problems in a more efficient manner than the auto encoder approach. I think for optical, we, uh, solving the problem optical with what we call the nonlinear Fourier transform. If I take the hardware, people are the hardware discrepancies, there's been some progress in looking at the models using Busgang theorem. And I think this is the approach we should go forward because we don't need to retrain every time. Now, a last note on that. I'm quite surprised by the fact that some of the AI community are throwing all the legacy research we've been doing since uh, more than 70 years and trying to replace the whole AI As a researcher, what do we do? And how I can benefit from both. And this is what I call the convergence of data-driven approaches with model-driven approaches. And the question that we should ask ourselves is that we may have, we may not have the right models for all the different components, but there are many things we know. So the question is how to combine the things we know with the things we don't know. And there maybe a bit of AI can help to improve drastically the system. And so uh, how to do it is not easy because uh, uh, the way it's done today is based on an autoencoder approach. And so you cannot put prior information that you have on your channel model as prior information on a given layer on your network, okay? Which means that we need to come with new types of algorithms, which do basically machine learning types, and on which you can provide the prior that you have on your model. Just to give you an example, today, today how we merge basically the data-driven and the uh, uh, model-driven approach is to do this way which I think is not the best way, but in some cases it works. What you do is that if you have a model, based on that model, you generate data, okay? And, or a simulator is a model, you generate data. Once you have generated data, you input it in a neural network and you train that neural network, which is just a step to translate a model into basically language, which is an architecture, clear? That's one way to do it. Once you have that architecture, when you have the real data based on the measurements that you do because you have unknowns, then basically you will train your neural network not by taking random initialization of all your parameters, but the ones who are exactly based on the model that you have. So if your model has small discrepancies, it will work perfectly. If you have some off-the-shelf model, then of course it doesn't work. But still, in this approach that you're seeing in many papers, it's not the best way to do because it's not a very good framework. And I think if you would ask me, it's not autoencoder versus model. It's mostly how to bridge the gap between both.
Okay, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'll get this last question since we are uh, already over time, and there is the last of the the rest of the conference. Uh, so, Professor Daniel Costa here from Ceará, from Fortaleza. Uh, he mentions that there is currently uh, the necessity to address the problem of uh, people still unconnected to the internet. So what do you think uh, will be the role of uh, artificial intelligence to address this kind of uneven distribution? So there is a, a lot of unbalanced data that we have to, we'll have from those kind of, uh, this problem of unconnected people in the, around the world. Yeah, this is a, a tough question. So people are trying to address it. So there are two things. There's the problem of connectivity and the problem of the exploitation of data, which is not, uh, representing the whole kind of features of the people because of these unconnected people for which we don't have access to data. So on one, one the case which, around, which is specifically around AI is of course the problem of bias, the sense that uh, because we have unconnected people, we get more and more data from the connected and it only improves those people and not the unconnected. And so whatever system that we build is not gonna exploit the system and the bias in AI techniques is extremely important for which there's a work. Second, of course, is the classical, I would say, connection, let's say, uh, of a classical network on how to improve that. I didn't mention, of course, one of the big trends today is, and it's already being done in 5G, is of course the combination of what we call or integration of satellite and cellular and how to mix both to be able to solve that issue. Uh, today, as you know, uh, there is a big trend of mostly software companies going in the communication, uh, I would say, realm. Uh, typically, uh, software companies like Amazon and others, Facebook, which are doing that. And I think it's going to be interesting in the next years to see how the massive amount of basically satellites, which are going to be poured in space, with the massive densification of infrastructure that we're going to see on Earth, is going to be integrated in a fruitful manner. I didn't mention this, but this is certainly a hot topic. Yeah, uh, satellite systems are seems to be a very promising approach to solve those connection questions. So, everyone, uh, I'm sorry I have to finish the session. So it was a very nice presentation and very nice discussion. I hope you did. And I hope you had enjoyed, uh, everyone has enjoyed we had a lot of good discussion, good questions. And I also hope we can meet uh, physically <laughs> very soon, as, as soon as this craziness stops. And then maybe you can come back to Brazil and discuss in person with some of those that have put questions to our audience, from our audience, okay? So the next in the behalf of the organization committee, I would like to thank you very much for your nice, fantastic presentation, for accepting the invitation, and for everything that uh, you have discussed in, the, in your talk. Okay. Thank you for, very much. For the rest of the audience, uh, please go on. Yeah, thank you all, and hope to see you next time. Thank you. Yeah. And for the rest, so we have the, 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 the other session. So you need to go back to the, the launch on the, our web system and then f choose the session that you would like to, to watch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. And have a good conference. And everyone, thank you again. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.